Good day, everyone, and welcome again to another Come Let Us Reason Together podcast. You know, when missionaries get ready to go out into foreign lands, they would have to do some things in preparation in order to spread the gospel. They'd have to learn the language, understand the fact that uh, some of the idioms, some of the expressions that we have, wouldn't make sense to those in other cultures. They'd have to understand what those people may deem as being offensive. For example, in many Middle Eastern countries, you never would extend your left hand to a person in a greeting. That's considered an insult. One of the things that many Christians fail to realize is that even today in our own culture, there's a large gap in understanding between Christians and the broader secular world. In this podcast, we explore those tripwires, those things that may actually hinder our efforts at witnessing, even though we don't realize they exist. I'm joined uh, again with the Apologetics.com team, and I hope you enjoy this podcast where we address the barriers to Christianity. Good evening and welcome to the Apologetics.com radio show. My name is Harry Edwards and I am your host for this evening. It's a show where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. Now, a while ago over the recording, you heard Josh say that some of the... uh, some portions of this show might be pre-recorded, but I assure you, none of it this evening is pre-recorded. So we're we're totally live. Um, so uh, in studio with me are my good friends, Jake, Doctor Jacob Daniel. How you doing? I'm doing very well, Harry. Good to be here. And Lenny Esposito, how you doing? Great. I'm uh, always happy to engage and and talk about real issues. So I love it. Real important issues. That's right. Uh, so, t- t- what's going on in your various ministries, gentlemen? Tell me, uh, give me a little bit of an update. I'm sure our listeners would love to know more about what's going on at Come Reason Ministries. Well, we uh, things have been very busy. We're planning a big uh, apologetics conference, the Dare to Defend Conference for Southern California. It's going to happen actually one month, four weeks from today, uh, in Corona at Living Truth. Uh, we have J.P. Moreland, Sean McDowell, Ken Samples, myself— Dr. Jacob Daniel will be there presenting a breakout session, uh, a couple of other fi- folks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and tickets are on sale. You can go to daretodefend.com and buy your ticket, and uh, hopefully you'll come out and join us. It's two days. It's lunch is included, the whole thing. It's going to be a, a really great opportunity to to learn about everything from deconstruction to critical race theory to um, archaeology to, you know, how to share your faith with millennials. So lots of stuff going on. That is cool. What about you, Jacob? How's everything going with Heritage Council? Going well, yeah. Just I'm so excited, um, Lenny, for this conference as well. Uh, and I'm speaking on what does it mean to be a And person. we're doing it the same night as the radio show. So that's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, is it our night when we're... Yes. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm really excited for that. Uh, and I'm also looking forward to a, a panel discussion and a talk that's coming on the whole topic of race to young people. Uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, in about two weeks' time. Um, so, yeah, keeping really busy. I'm really excited for um, the way the ministry is becoming relevant in light of the challenges that we are facing in culture, and not just culture w- within the United States, but also globally in terms of um, the reach that we have now and the message and the importance of it. So grateful for when that. When will that conference end again? What time? <laughs> <laughs> well, on Friday it ends about 9 o'clock. Okay. So... Yeah. Right. Well, and Jacob doesn't speak till Saturday, so he doesn't have to make the drive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I might be joining you. Okay. Well, yeah, it might actually be perfect because uh, Tim Muloff, he's been on the program before. He wrote a book, um, a new book, and the title escapes me right now. Do you guys remember? But anyways, it's a good Winning book. Winning Conversations? No, that was, no, his, no. Uh, that was his previous one. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's definitely good, and we are having him next month. Great. Oh, so okay. maybe you can join me in the studio. That'll be great. Yeah, yeah. all right. Good. Um, well, our topic for this evening's show is addressing barriers to belief. 
specifically barriers to belief in Christianity. If you've been following us for a while, you'd know we're covering Paul Gold's book titled Cultural Apologetics. There you go. You see it now. Since we're on YouTube, on video, you see it. We highly recommend it. In fact, uh, I would recommend that you buy the book and then look over our shows from the past, and maybe it'll be a good guide to the Mm. book. Um, uh, So, again, we highly recommend it. I personally believe it's the right way of doing apologetics in today's fragmented context, and we will discuss uh, this evening what we mean by fragmented, uh, that, that our... Uh, The world in which we live is, especially here in the West, is kind of fragmented in in terms of um, how Christians especially live, you know, how we view the world. Uh, But before we get into the topic, really, I'd just like to remind our listeners that we are supported entirely by you, uh, by your generous donations. And so uh, if you have an opportunity, go to our site, www.apologetics.com, and click on that Donate button. And um, all, all of the monies that you send our way goes directly to uh, our cost, at, l- at least for now. Uh, some of you know that uh, I am, for this year, my goal is to at least raise uh, my halftime support. Um, so I'm moving in, in that direction. Uh, so I'm going to be raising support. Um, and Jacob, I, I talked to you a while ago. We formed a new board, and so after we meet, uh, we will um, have more uh, and frequent communications about what's going on at apologetics.com. All right, so let's get into the chapter, gentlemen. So chapter 7, it's addressing barriers, and Dr. Gold here divides— uh, these barriers really into two main categories. One is internal and the other external. So internal are barriers that uh, are, are really endemic to Christianity, like us. As followers of Jesus, sometimes we have to admit, and if we're honest with ourselves, we are the barriers. The church is the barrier. Uh, So that's unfortunate, and he mentions three things. I'll I'll mention it really quickly, and then we want to go over these uh, one by one. The first one is anti-intellectualism. The second is fragmentation. And the last one is unbaptized imagination. So we want to go over those things. I think it's really helpful to um, just organize our thoughts around these barriers. So Intellectualism, Mark Knoll, uh, an evangelical, wrote uh, a seminal work uh, pretty much pointing out the fact that evangelicals, that that's a specific set of, of Christians who uh, sort of have abandoned the virtue of thinking. In fact, the, a, a very famous quote in the beginning of, the, uh, of his book, says, uh, he says, the scandal of the evangelical mind is that there is not much of an evangelical mind. What a scathing hmm. remark. Uh, I, I think the title of the book is The Scandal of the Evangelical right. Mind. Uh, must read, um, and, and, and you'll get what we're saying here. But gentlemen, let's, let's get into this. Anti-intellectualism. Uh, how many of you personally have thought that this could be a barrier? Have you guys experienced this? I'm sure not of yourselves, but maybe listening to others, reading others. Or, or, or even trying to start up a, a ministry in a church where, um, you know, you hear, well, I don't need all of that theology study stuff all i need is jesus i yeah, you know pretty, how many times have we heard these kinds of issues like no creed but jesus right? yes yes but that, and, and so the early church, creed. <laughs> yeah the the early church would be rolling over right because i mean the 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 work that went into forming the creed you know <clears throat> you can't tell how do you tell who's a christian and who's not a christian right unless you have a boundary uh, at least a broad-based definition, what C.S. Lewis would call, you know, mere Christianity or basic Christianity. And that's what the creeds did, the the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. The, these were the broad stroke outline of what defines us as the body of Christ. 
And I think the danger is uh, the reason why people, I, I believe people do is because they do not understand that we are called to pursue intellect, not purely for the sake of intellect. We employ intellect for the sake of the glory of God. Right. And knowing and understanding the mind of God. You know, we've been given the mind of Christ. Um, a mind of Christ does something. Um, so I think there are, there are challenges at two levels, right? One is that you, especially in the academia, we find uh, among the secularists, I mean, they would question our intellect. The, uh, they would question us to, that we are not intellectual enough, mm. that we don't have the right to actually engage in that domain. Yeah. The other is the church, what you were talking about. We don't need to be engaging in that realm. Right. Uh, so challenges are from both sides. Yeah. So, so, And here's what I say, and this is something... <clears throat> We are created of a different kind of thing than the animal kingdom, right? It, it's common for naturalists, for others to categorize us as just, uh, as Desmond Morris would put it, the naked ape, right? The, we're, just, we're just farther along in an evolutionary paradigm, but we're the same kind of thing as all of the other beasts. And... We know biblically that we're endowed with the image of God. We are not of the same kind. We're of a different kind. If you think about it, one of the things that separates us from the beasts is our ability to understand ourselves, to understand our world, and to understand God. Hmm. It is the fact that we can think and can reason. That's what makes us more human. If we react with feelings— the way our culture says, what we're doing is we're, we're debasing ourselves. We're being more beast-like. It's a good point. And, and so the, the, the fraternity guy who just wants to put notches on his bedpost, well, he's no different than you know the, the dog in heat, hmm. right? He, they, they, C.S. Lewis who said, you're, feeling, you're feeding your appetites, your, your, your stomach. And uh, no, we need men with chests who can understand these things and, and mitigate them through the role of reason. That's what makes us more human, and God calls us to be more human, not more beastly. And it is right on our face now with, with what's going on around the world in terms of geopolitics that yes. we are, we're seeking those men with chest. Yeah. Yes. You know, I just got reminded, our motto here at apologetics.com is— we say we're challenging believers to think yeah. and thinkers to believe. So I'm hoping that in the last 20 years we've been doing that, gentlemen. I hope so. But that's what you know we try to do. Uh, in fact, I was just mentioning, right, uh, minutes before the show, our churches were the ones that started uh, universities. Yeah. It's Christians that started places of higher learning, especially. Uh, and in fact, we started those institutions because the idea was to train men and women for ministry, that we thought so highly of uh, the intellect that we needed training in, in this field, in this area. Uh, yeah. I think world around, if you see, um, there were universities and institutions and places of learning. What Christianity has offered to the world is universali universalizing that. Mm -hmm. uh, making it available for anyone to pursue learning. And that was a Christian endeavor. Uh, it wasn't just uh, a privilege of some or the elite in the society, but it was open for all. Uh, all could understand what God has spoken right. uh, uh, to humanity in terms of their flourishing, in terms of their salvation. And I think um, we have we, exactly that's what we have abandoned in yeah. Uh, these institutions that were started as seminaries. They were all started as trin Trinitarian seminaries, right? Uh, the idea was that God has revealed himself. A revelation and reason were the sources of truth. And uh, thanks to enlightenment and post after that, we find that we have abandoned revelation completely. We took over reason to be the only basis for knowing truth. And in our postmodern culture, we are abandoning reason as well and going after feelings yeah. and, and how we feel about something. So there is a need for church to redeem and reclaim this domain of coming to truth through revelation as well as reason. And something that I've been pushing on, Harry, yeah, you know that lately, was the whole idea of church-based academy, um, institutions as an extension of church. 
informing the church and being informed by the church so that we can uh, fulfill the commission of discipling the nations that Christ has uh, well, entrusted that's, us that's with. That's Vishal yeah. Mangalwadi's yes. uh, latest project right yeah. now. So again, that name, Vishal Mangalwadi, look him up and uh, you'll find out uh, how he's connected with this third education revolution. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Where he pictures the church as being centers of learning again, and literally um, uh, uh, building it as parallel options to universities. Yeah, we are to think God's thoughts after him, right? It, it, the, the scripture says that it is the glory of God to, to, dis, uh, to uh, conceal a matter, and it is the glory of man to find that matter out. And that's why the sciences were born. It, it, it's not merely... You know, scripture reading, although that was theology was the queen of the sciences. Uh, but beyond that, it was understanding all of God's revelation, even through his natural world, as much as it was through his written word. So, Right. So, uh, gentlemen, how do we fix this then? How do we reclaim, restore education's right place? How do we make uh, thinking and learning and study a virtue again? Uh, I think one of the ways, uh, thanks to uh, the current circumstances, um, we are recognizing the importance of family in the task Mm -hmm. of educating our future generation. Uh, Parents will have to take this responsibility of uh, investing time and efforts and knowledge into the life of their children. one thing I believe parents, especially here in the West, that we are not seeing anymore because of the busyness and also losing um, the whole understanding of inheritance and heritage that we no more talk about. I think knowledge and truth m- must be left for future generation to be inherited. We have to leave that heritage of learning and knowing truth and pursuing truth. And I think it has to start in the family. You know, it's interesting, but uh, since we're talking about education, in the last two years, we've experienced the pandemic. You know, no one's been uh, immune unless, uh, from that knowledge unless you've been living under a rock. But uh, it has affected or it has exposed some of the weaknesses in uh, our educational system, at least here in America, right? To where, let's say, the, the homeschooling segment was about 2 to 3%. Now it's it's about 11. So yeah. it's grown three it's times exploded. in the last two years. So like you were saying, to your point, Jacob, parents are beginning to wake up, and they're realizing that uh, their kids are just ill-equipped <laughs> in terms of the learning. What are they learning in uh, the public school system? Uh, that, that needs major reform. Uh, hopefully that's not shocking news. Well, and, and it ties to the other aspect of this, you know, uh, Let's face it, learning is hard. Hmm. It takes work. It's, it's Exercise is hard. It takes work. But nobody, you know, come January 1st, there's a lot of resolutions for people saying, well, I'm going to get in shape this year. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Okay, that's fine. But nobody doubts that exercise is a good thing for us and that we should do it more. Learning also is a good thing for us and we should do it more. And maybe the model of learning as it has been filtered through the public school system is the wrong type of model. You know, I think one of the ways that we can cultivate this is to really broadcast and and come become comfortable with the fact that Jesus was as much of an intellectual as he was a a pastor or a healer or any of these other. Luke chapter 20 is a masterful chapter of Jesus using logic and argumentation, knowing his adversaries, studying their uh, beliefs, understanding what they valued, and answering them in a, an appropriate way in order to disarm them. He, Jesus was, if he's anything, he's, as Dallas Wallow says, the smartest man who ever lived. And we never think of Jesus as an intellect. We think of him as a lot of other things. But if Jesus was an intellect, and of course, what Christian would say, no, he was dumb. <laughs> no, he, he was, if he's the smartest man who ever lived and we are to conform ourselves into his image— then what does that say about what we need to do? That's right. That's there, there's right. also uh, you know, something that uh, Dr. Ben Merkel, who is the president of New St. Andrews in Idaho, uh, which is a college, uh, who, who kind of like pointed this out, out recently, that the Christian institution has been labeled them. You know, they have to take the responsibility of not transferring the responsibility of blame on the students. Mm. 
what we need to be doing is that asking the institution, are we being relevant in the context in which we are? A lot of institutions are outdated in many sense in terms of engaging with the world. Yeah. We need to be looking at within the church itself, within the institution itself, yeah. as to are we relevant enough in terms of how the culture is, how the structure around, uh, uh, how people are perceiving knowledge, yeah. coming to knowledge, yeah. and making education relevant for them. Yeah, no, I like that. The, that is their main responsibility is teaching, yeah. not absorbing what culture uh, is around them, no, they're they're supposed to be transferring these timeless truths, right? Um, all right, so l- let's get to the second uh, internal barrier, which is fragmentation. So, what do you think Dr. Gould means by that? And and I I sent the outline to you guys, and I, I kind of put this common phrase out there, and I, I really think what Dr. Gould is saying is. Uh, what does it mean to live between the mundane and the transcendent? You know, kind of like being in the world but not of it. So we're fragmented that way. We're either uh, drawn to one side of the issue or the other. We go or to some extremes, of both. or some of both. Right. We, we, most people in their lives tend to take uh, approach their beliefs in kind of a salad bar fashion. Oh, I like a little bit of this. I like a little bit of that. You know, but what they're not doing is understanding how those tastes, so to speak, blend together or, or clash, and that's part of the problem. Is uh, when we engage with folks. They're fragmented and they don't understand that if you hold this belief, then you can't hold that one. They both – they don't work. And, and he used uh, – one of the examples he used later on is the, the life of Pi. Yeah. If you've seen the, the movie or read the book, you, you know, and he, he talks about how the kid was Christian – Right, um, Krishna and yeah. Muslim all at the same time, and you can't do that. You, right. you know, they're they're mutually exclusive beliefs. They they all can't hold out together. I was even engaged with an individual who was a, a Vedanta Buddhist, mm-hmm. and she was saying, "Well, all truth is God's truth." I said, "No." Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, right? Or uh, God so loved the world, he sent his only son. And, and the suras say, God does not beget, nor is he begotten. Well, that's just how you're interpreting it, she says. I haven't interpreted it. I quoted two verses, one from the Bible, his only begotten son, and one from the Quran. God does not beget, nor is he begotten. You can't have both of those at the same time. Right, yeah. right. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, th- there is this realm, though, uh, we have to understand where people are drawn to awe and reverence and worship, mm. which is also found at a place where transcendent meets the imminence, which happens in the place in, in the realm of beauty. Yes. That's why whenever we are, con- we are confronted with beauty, it demands a kind of awe and reverence. And I think we, we need to capture that as well. I agree. And yeah. people, I, I think a lot of people, uh, it, it might be beauty of the truth that they encounter, beauty of the nature that they encounter, that Paul, uh, Paul Gould actually talks about how much distant we are now yeah. from the nature itself where God does reveal himself. Um, I think capturing that realm of being in that place where imminence and transcendence meet uh, is so much vital, even, and we missed that out, especially in in the whole project of apologetics. Yeah. We don't capture that. We even we get so fragmented that we go mm. on the cognitive side completely, exclusively, or on the, on the imminent yeah. side. Yeah, we're rationalistic. Yeah. yeah, it's good to be. I always say it's good to be rational. It's not good to be rationalistic. <laughs> um, so, like for me, I was sharing a while ago with you guys that. Uh, one way that it manifests in the churches, and, and because to me, in some ways, it's the result of anti-intellectualism, we no longer how, uh, know how to think about important issues like faith and government, you know, uh, church and state. We dichotomize them. We, we create a false dichotomy right. on those, because we no longer know how to think about those issues, so we're fragmented. So... If we think that we need to be more involved with politics, then we're saying, oh, then we lack faith in God because we're not just trusting God for the outcome. Mm -hmm. But if we're just, uh, let's say, totally distance ourselves with politics, then 
then the, the, there are the ramifications that and, follow. And this, it is this kind of philosophy that Christianity basically attacked at, at, at its root, yeah. right? The very Greek philosophy of really making, uh, making the spiritual as um, over uh, the physical yeah. and going after that. I think uh, Christianity offers a credible answer in terms of bringing both our physical and spiritual together yeah. yes. as uh, how does that apply in us in terms of being embodied beings. We need to blurry the line between secular and sacred. We need to be doing more of that. Now, of course, we understand the difference, but we Christians, we're so good at just putting that hard barrier between the two things, and we miss out on God's creation and beauty that's there. In fact, there's a great quote here by Miroslav Volf, um, I think it's uh, appropriate in our context. He said, attachment to God amplifies and deepens enjoyment of the world. So it's secular and sacred coming together. Yeah, if God is God over everything, he's God over our political understanding as well right. and our interpretation. And we need to recognize him as the center and the the way we understand everything else. It is the knowledge of God and the truth of God that helps us to distinguish between the the world that God created and how we must enjoy in it God's way with the system of the world which we should shun and fight against. In your own experience, guys, how do you uh, try to be in the world but not of it? I, I know we're probably have two minutes to flesh that hmm. out. But uh, I just want to end with, with that. Uh, but in your own personal lives, how do you guys do that? Uh, again, try to remember how uh, how I am saved and try to understand God in a way that I would say, is this is this the ethos of what Christianity is? Self-denial right? Take up your cross and, and follow me. Hmm. Um, these kinds of ideas, whereas even if you're wronged, you still continue to love your brother. You still continue to do it. Even if you know you may be abused in it, you still continue to do so uh, because it's what God would have us do. Yeah. And for me, it is also living in light of the ascension and session of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The fact that he is sitting at the right hand of God. And not just that, he makes us to sit with him in the heavenly places for a reason as to how does that inform the fact that Jesus is king over all things informs yeah. us being his subject and how does his kingdom comes into yeah. our world that we live in. And that's not just for the eschaton that's no right now right for, for our family for our church and for the for the world that god has given us one of my favorite verses is john ten ten. jesus said that he had come to give life he didn't stop there but life abundantly right we forget that uh, and when we say this we're not saying that our best life now Right. No, that's completely, we that await a king who is going to take away all pain. We await a king who's going to remove all, the, win over the last enemy, the death, right? Right, And we will have the ultimate uh, vision of what that uh, beauty and what that life is like. But we, we, we strive towards that. We, in the meantime, the kingdom that he has inaugurated, we enjoy this world in light of that, in light of the eternity that Christ has promised us. Okay, so I think there is the music that is queuing up, and so we will be right back after a few messages. Well, welcome back to the Apologetics.com radio show. My name is Harry Edwards, and I am your host for this evening. We have been, in the last half hour, we've been talking about barriers to Christianity, Christian faith, to belief. And uh, we mentioned, um, the first one we mentioned was anti-intellectualism. The second one was fragmentation. The third one that we want to cover is what uh, Paul Gold calls unbaptized imagination. Now, that's a fancy term right there. I wonder what uh, that could mean. 
Jacob, Dan, uh, you guys, what, what do you think, Lenny? I mean, well, uh, you know, and he points to Charles Taylor, and 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 throughout the book, he's talked about this disenchanted world. Mm-hmm. But basically, people used to understand themselves as a smaller part of a larger universe. That that ultimately God is in control, and even if tragedies happened. Um, there was some semblance of understanding that if we serve God, then he and and those aspects of our lives that are given over to him, he will control that and it'll all come out to work together for good. We, we saw ourselves as not the center of our existence. I'm not talking about the whole center of the universe. There are those yeah. people. Yeah. But the, he we see ourselves nowadays as the center of our existence and we don't we see most of what we do as not mattering in terms of our faith if i watch tv does it matter that i i'm a christian or not if i eat yogurt does it matter whether i'm a christian or not whereas in previous eras they understood themselves as servants to the king and everything they did reflected on that and so we don't see ourselves in the same way. And that's what I think he means when he talks about an unbaptized imagination. Our right. self-perception is, is secularized, even though we are redeemed for our whole lives and our whole bodies. And when uh, he mentions imagination, again, he takes a lot of his cues from Charles Taylor, Charles. which is a must-read. Also, James K.A. Smith, also a must-read author. But uh, we're not talking about the fanciful ideas and dreaming creativity. of dragons, right? <laughs> when, when, uh, at, at least in our show, and and when you hear philosophers and even apologists, although not a lot of apologists actually use this term the way it's meant to be used, but at least on our shows, when we say imagination, and we did a whole show on imagination, we're talking about this. Uh, uh, again, I, I like doing etymology, and it comes from the Latin word imaginary, which literally means picture to oneself. So th- that's actually a good way to remember imagination or the, the social imaginary, as Charles Taylor would, would coin that phrase. And um, think of it as the way ordinary people imagine their social surrounding carried in images, stories, and legends. So you have to think about, like like you were saying to your point, Lenny, when we wake up in the morning, it's not like we have a list or we consult our tablet to, 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 to see what we're going to be doing for the day. Mm-hmm. We probably brush our teeth and take a shower without even thinking about it. Right. So that's all part of our social imaginary. We wake up a certain time. We don't think about it. We go to work and then we sit down on our desks if you have a desk job type of a work. And then you do these certain things and they're just habits, you know, and maybe every weekend you might go see a movie, eat out with, you know, on get get on a date with your loved one. And it, it's just the thing that you do. Uh, and that's in the West, right? And I was mentioning a while ago, regrettably, like, like right now, um, I was watching the news like many of you guys are watching the news, and we have this horrible uh, news of Russia invading Ukraine. And so you had these journalists showing what life is like right now, and their social imaginary is being turned upside down right now. But it's, it's fascinating to see how they're holding on to what they know as their life, you know, like they're saying, oh yeah, we brought our toys for the kids and they're playing around and they, they're showing this bag of food uh, and, and they're just lighthearted about it because it's it's like a, in their minds, it's a temporary disruption. Right. But I doubt that it, it is, you know, I mean, we're watching here and we know it's not going to be good. And that's why Christians, please pray for Ukraine. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on right there, especially our brothers and sisters in the Lord. So if you can imagine that, and it's hard to imagine, that's the thing. It's hard to get out of your comfort zones. It's hard to imagine life outside of your current life. In fact, like I was saying, you know, these Ukrainians, 
it seems like it's just an interruption, you know. Uh, but they will soon realize, unless God intervenes, it's going to be so much different. Uh, so, so that's what we mean, um, that it could be a barrier because uh, we are just so into our very narrow slice of life, and uh, we can't be bothered by certain things. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's mundane. It's the mundane view of life, right? It, right you're, but, but can you, can you, as an accountant, do taxes to the glory of God? I mean, it, and not just say it, but actually have that attitude in you right. that you are what you are doing is serving God by because he gave me the ability to add these numbers. He gave me the ability to understand. He gave me the, the contacts and the individuals that I can serve by doing so honestly and things of that nature. Yeah. And we need to be also recognizing that our imaginations, uh, you know, are constantly catechized by uh, how we respond to the stimulations around us. Oh, yeah. Right? And especially uh, because every um, th- there is always a force or an attempt to uh, form your imagination to conform to the collective. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's not on the basis of truth, but on the basis of what works for that community or the collective, right? Mm-hmm. So, So it is important for us to really baptize our imagination That's right. with the word of the truth yeah. that God has yeah. revealed. I, I, I think, I think, and he, Paul Gould points out um, our over-reliance on digital yeah. uh, appliances and social networks. So, so I, I talk about people who are looking to be what I call Pinterest perfect, hmm. right? <laughs> Whereas, you know, you, you, you take the, and, and you see this even in Christian circles, you've got the Bible, you've got the coffee cup and everything's positioned just right. And it's like doing morning devotions and every, you, I the got right lighting, 30 yeah. likes on my, you don't see outside the frame that the bed is unmade, the child's <laughs> in diapers, dirty clothes are all right. But, but inside the frame, now everybody knows Two things. They all know that outside the frame, it's a disaster. <laughs> we, we, we know this. But at the same time, nobody uses that as their standard. They all judge it by what they see inside that picture only. And that's a, it's a facade. Hmm. And, yeah. and what you're saying is absolutely true because this be, now becomes our catechizer. This starts to be training us as to what we should think and how we, oh, I can't have my morning devotions like that, therefore I'm not going to have them. Hmm. And that's And so as bad. cultural apologists, and Gold actually explic- explicitly yeah. says that this is very serious, this is very important. And what he's saying here, uh, again, I want to emphasize, is we are not just believing creatures. That's the thing. In fact, you were just pointing out Dallas Willard's uh, uh, thing about how even we can learn things through our actions, yeah. that we form beliefs through our actions. And that is absolutely true. That's antithetical to the rationalist in us. Uh, and, and so if that is true, that truth literally could be absorbed by our bodies, as James K. Smith would say, what does that mean for apologetics, right, or evangelism, that we have to care and we have to uh, devote some of our resources into how people can learn and relearn things, not just through the intellect or through the cognitive uh, features of our, of our, you know, bodies, I guess. So we, we do have that, and uh, that is something to uh, focus on, uh, we need to realize that many times we are just controlled by our habits and we don't see it. Again, that's part yeah. of our social imaginary. And, and that's why sometimes, right, we are shocked that um, th- that non-Christians accuse us of X, Y, and Z because we've been so blindsided mm. by certain things. Uh, and Harry, uh, here we're not saying that we have to abandon this this truth that we do form habits, right? Uh, um, uh, not in the absence of the collective, but in the presence of them. 
uh, in the presence of people. That This is why, especially in these times in which we are living, gathering as people who believe in God and worship Him is so important. That's right. That we are not just sitting in our b- right. bedrooms and worshiping God. It is so important for us to gather together and form those habits Right? That's right, having a sacramental, yep. sacramental in- view of the reality that God has offered yeah. us, and worship Him in the in the light of that. Yeah, so much important because we're not like as Descartes says, just merely brains on a stick. Yeah, <laughs> we're not just that. Um, so, anyways, that's good, right? So those three things uh, are under the internal barrier of um, just difficulties to overcome for non-believers to see the the beauty of Christianity. Again, anti-intellectualism, fragmentation, and an unbaptized imagination. Uh, Let's move on to the external barriers to faith. Um, And I know Paul Gold mentions a few. Uh, These aren't earth-shattering ideas. If you are are a Christian or uh, that is alive today— You know, there are a lot of issues uh, that serve as barriers to faith. One is, well, one is like science disproves God, the idea that because now we have science, that science one day will explain everything and that there is no need of God. Uh, By the way, that is in itself self-refuting, as Mm. we all know. Um, So... Again, uh, enlighten some of our listeners. What do we mean by uh, a self-refuting statement? So if if science is all there is and science proves everything, uh, how, how, how is that a uh, self-refuting statement? Well, you have to ask, what kind of science did you do to do, you know, find this out? What, what did you boil under a Bunsen burner? Did the smoke come out and, 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 and that's what it said? You know, no, that's a philosophical statement. There's, there's no science that makes that claim it's so a self-refuting statement is something like i cannot say more than three words Mm. in english Mm -hmm. well (laughs) i think that's more than three (laughs) or married bachelors yeah Yeah. square circles that kind of yeah Yeah, a triangle with four sides Uh, the assumption here is that we can arrive at truth only through um you know uh, empirical understanding of the reality but that there's no other way exactly empirical yeah yeah Sometimes it's nice, you know, again, we're uh, on YouTube now. It's like you draw a big circle, right? And you say, uh, let's say this represents the knowledge of everything. Draw a big circle. And then you say, how much of that would you think you know? You know, and then maybe the guy might draw a little bit. And we if they're honest, that, right? They're honest. Yeah. They'll draw a little bit of circle there. Yeah, you know, I know a little bit, but, well, what if— the knowledge of God is actually here, you know, then you just haven't inspected that area, right? And I mean, think about it. I mean, each day, how much of the truth that we believe in is a revealed truth, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. That's right. Can well, you can we yeah. even have any relationship or, or any joy in any relationship unless certain truths are revealed mm-hmm. between those relationships? Well, and even science itself, we, we have to acknowledge that science owes a debt to Philosophy, specifically logic, law of non-contradiction, things like that. That's how you test a hypothesis. You try and find out if if it's false or not. Yeah. Uh, science owes a debt to theology in the fact that uh, there is a God where we assume that our test results today will probably be continuous tomorrow. There's a, there's a con- continuity to the universe. And science owes a debt to morality because you're a uh, assuming that the uh, reports that you're going to get will be from honest people and they'll report things accurately. Mm-hmm. So there's there's all these other types of knowledge, moral knowledge, uh, assumptions of theological knowledge that God is going to con- have a continuous universe, mm-hmm. and, and logical knowledge that are, that are the bedrock before science can even get off the ground. Yeah, and, and you know, science, the, the end of science is not only truth but truth that worships the one who makes science possible. There you go. Great. That's that's, uh, insightful, gentlemen. How about uh, this one external barrier? Jesus as the one and only God. That's intolerant. So that somehow is a barrier to Hmm. many today. Why? why, How how do we address that to um, someone who might, for them, it is a barrier? 
Well, there, uh, I remember how Greg Kokel uh, did it. He talks about how he walked into a college class and he wrote two st- statements. The first one is, I believe that one should be tolerant of all religious claims. And the second one was, those who don't believe in Jesus of Nazareth are going to hell. And people say, well, you can't write that second one. <laughs> well, do you agree with the first one? Well, yes. <laughs> well, if you agree with the first one, the second one is a religious claim, and therefore you you can't have both. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think when it comes to tolerance, I mean, we should we should all be intolerant about bad ideas, hmm. right? We should be intolerant about not about people, right? When it comes to their value and when it comes to respecting people, we we are called to be tolerant, right? But when it comes to bad ideas, we all are called to be intolerant. If we are not intolerant about ideas, what we have is called reformers' dilemma. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have any reformers. Yeah. We would never That's respect right. any individual who's brought about any. Uh, we will not respect William Wilberforce who fought against slavery. Yeah, right, we will right. not respect. Uh, other leaders, Martin Luther civil, King, Martin Luther King yeah, for sure. civil like, rights. I, I don't want my brain surgeon to be tolerant of of just any path of surgery. I want him to actually be pretty narrow, yeah, and and and, and devoted to a very right. specific approach, right. not coming. You know, oh well, we're going to operate starting at the stomach. And yeah. No, that's not what we. Want. I, I would tell our listeners that be choosy about what you're tolerant about. Right. Right. Exactly. And again, what we're talking about here speaks to the whole. Uh, nature of truth. Yes, uh, it is a narrow thing. Like one plus one is two. It's not three. It's not a host of other things. It is just two, right? So that's just the nature of truth. In fact, we know, right, that uh, we all live our lives very intolerant of ideas. You know, we uh, we look both ways when we cross the street. Uh, we don't look up and down. You know, it's both ways. Because uh, speeding cars that are going to hit us are going to cause great pain, and yeah. we don't want that. It's not how you feel about those kinds of things. So, all right, how about um, this one is purportedly, right, to be one of the – it's a perennial problem that Christianity faces apparently, and uh, philosophers love to to just um, camp on this, and that's the problem of evil. Is God really – good after all he uh he allowed uh putin to invade ukraine and so there are thousands that are dead and thousands more that are injured right unprovoked and and they get attacked so how is god good when he seems to just be standing by and watching things unfold yeah i think we need to be taking a step back and asking what do we mean by good and Mm -hmm. by whose standard um is it the standard of how I feel about this thing. Is, am I the standard? Is the government the standard? Is a collective group that I'm part of is a standard? Or is there an, an absolute standard to which I'm appealing to? And who, who or what is that absolute standard? Who offers that moral framework to define what is good and what is not? If God's not in picture, then we are only appealing to the good that we feel is good. Yeah, it's uh, relativism. It's yeah. it's relativism basically. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is if if God has to be in the picture in terms of uh, for us to be understanding what is good and what is evil, and this God allows for evil to exist in the kind of world that He has created, we need to be asking how that God has been good in the human story where we suffer and where we um, go through trials and tribulations and issues in life. And I think Christianity only offers where God steps into our suffering and suffers with us and brings us to a place where in his knowledge, uh, he, he, he is he's looking for people who, more valuable people who come through the suffering, mm. right? He finds them even more valuable and good, and God allows for that. And as a Christian, that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, I, th- I think I think you touch on something there that's very important. When you look at all faith systems, they all have to deal with some aspect of the problem of evil. If you're an atheist, well, then nature is just red in tooth and claw, and it's survival of the fittest. Now, if you're counseling people in a children's cancer ward, you know, telling the parents of a two-year-old, well, she just wasn't 
fit enough to survive, that doesn't offer much comfort. Uh, if you're uh, one of the is Eastern faiths, you know, uh, evil is maybe illusory or it's just simply if part of the fabric of the universe. It's no worse or no better than goodness. It it just is. Matter of fact, in a Buddhist understanding, everything is suffering. Hmm. Even love is suffering in certain aspects because you're going to eventually leave the loved one or they're going to leave you through death or what have you. Um, so evil is ultimately just an illusory part of the universe. You can't say that it's worse than anything else. But again, that, that rings hollow because we know that evil is there. We know that good is good. Uh, there has to be that contrast. And, and so Christianity is the only faith that I find that not only acknowledges that there's evil, but provides a solution to evil, that mm -hmm. one day death itself will be defeated, that evil will not triumph. Uh, it's popular in our cartoons to say, you know, love conquers evil, but what do you mean by that? In yeah. what way? And it's only the love of God who mitigates all evil. And Christianity is uh, relevant because it is not not true in the absence of evil. Right. But through through it. Through it. In it. Even through it. Yeah. Yeah. And the picture that we get from Christianity is, again, far and away different and and there's a redeeming quality to it because, like you were saying, Jacob, um, maybe in the end we really don't know why God allows certain things and why there's evil in this world. But you can't argue with a God who steps into your mm -hmm. suffering and has, has experienced the most gruesome evil yeah. that was done to him and say that I I got you here, you know, and I understand what you're going through. Right. And like you said, in the end, uh, wow. there is the final glory where we have our uh, renewed, glorified bodies for those whose faith is in the Lord, and there will be no more pain and suffering. Like you were saying a while ago, that the final enemy is vanquished, yeah. Yeah. death in the end. So the what about to our, our last point? Christianity is archaic, it's repressive, and unloving, um, especially when it comes to human sexuality. How do we address that, especially today when the LGBTQ plus and, and transgenderism and identity and all of those things are so rampant in, in, in culture today? I think this goes back to our unbaptized imagination and uh, as a culture. I think we un misunderstand sexuality writ large, and the church doesn't do a good job of teaching this. So remember what I said before, that one of the aspects of, of being human is to develop that thing that, that raises us a, away from the baser instincts in the animals. Think about this. God's greatest creative act he ever did was to create man and woman. We know that because he paid the ultimate price to redeem us, to buy us back in terms of his son. The ultimate, the closest we can get to mimicking God is when we join together in a physical union that creates new life. Ultimately, God is responsible. But here we are coming together, male and female, and the sexual union not only bonds humans together, but it has the express purpose of creating a new human being. That's the primary goal of the sexual relationship. What we have said is sex is for our pleasure, and therefore, it can be self-expressive. But that's getting the cart way wrong. It, 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 it rewrites the whole script. We don't understand sex as sanctified, as holy, as, a whole, as holy a relationship or, or as holy an act as any sacrament that we would see uh, a, a clergyman perform. Yeah, and I think this is why uh, whoever is asking this question will have to have um, think in this perspective that God's ethics are not just archaic. Yeah. They are the archetype of all ethics that can lead to human flourishing. Yeah, And I want to end with this quote by C.S. Lewis because 
I, I think it's a great reminder that the Christian faith is full of life. And like I said in John 10, 10, Jesus wants to give it to us abundantly because he cares about us, but not in a Joel Osteen sense. Uh, and sometimes we think our desires get in the way. In fact, in Buddhism, you need to vanquish desires because that's the right. main problem of life. So uh, C.S. Lewis said this, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around or fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So that is our show for this evening. Thank you, Jacob and Lenny and Emma. And I hope that you've learned something of value. Tune in again next week, and our other team will be here in the studio. Until next time, good night. Thank you for watching this Come Reason video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like these, consider subscribing to our Come Reason YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. And you can follow us on social media. Lastly, if you'd like to help keep these kinds of videos free, consider providing a donation by clicking on the donation button beside me. Thank you.